extremely uh, was extremely influential in my sobriety. You know, my my sponsor when I first came in gave me a few a few speaker tapes, and this was one of those ones that I held on to. And uh, I was young when I got sober, and I got this particular speaker tape. And I remember just thinking that was the most fascinating, awesome story that I'd ever heard. I never told June that, but I saw her at the Music City Roundup. And, um, you know, there are times where I never really cared too much about whether I, I met a, you know, there's a couple of people who are kind of famous out there that if you meet them, you get a little weird. But that doesn't weird me out. But people, I said, who are the people that you'd really love to meet? And it's usually people in AA, you know, a lot of the heroes that I have in AA. And June has been one of those people. And I think she, um, you know, one of the cool things about this is that, uh, I even changed my shirt tonight. I had a shirt that I didn't, I didn't really like on the thing. It didn't really do much with my skin. I walked upstairs and changed my shirt. My wife goes, why are you changing your shirt? Cause it was a nice shirt. I was like, honey, June G is speaking tonight. It needs to look good, you know? And, um, but I think that it's really, um, it's really neat to see somebody who, you know, I'm sober now, like 21 years, uh, sober since I was 18. June's been sober for a really long time. And how do you keep the step? Ex and I, I continue to, to participate in AA because of the fruit that it continues to bear in my life and grow in my life all the time. I mean, it's just everything good in my life has started with working through that process. But that's enough of me, June. Uh, I'm super excited to have you tonight. What a privilege. Thank you for agreeing to come on. Much love. Take it away. Oh, thank you. I'm going to start my timer so I have some sense here. My name's June and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you all very much for inviting me to be a part of your group. Um, and I, I love the subject matter and I love the idea. And thank you, Sam, for sending me a couple or, or more than a couple, but some of the other people that had shared. I actually listened to one of them and passed it on to a couple of my sponsees um, as well. So um, I really love that we're able to. Uh, to do that. And sometimes I can't even tell you how many times I've been helped by people whose talks I've heard that I've never even met over the years. So um, <clears throat> I think that's why we show up sometimes. Um, I don't know the tradition in, uh, you know, in this group, but I'll, I'll go ahead since there's people I know from all different parts of the country and I'll, I'll follow the Texas tradition. What the hell? We might as well start with something. And uh, that would be my sobriety date. So uh, my sobriety date is the 13th of July, 1972. That means that I have been sober continually um, for over 48 years, almost 49 this coming July. Um, I don't know, you know, if there are new people here or relatively new people here. Um, so I'll start out by saying a couple of things that are the most important thing that I ever say when I'm asked to share in this capacity. So the most important thing that I'd want you to know is that I'm not an expert on alcoholism, on any step, on any page in the big book, um, on Alcoholics Anonymous, and certainly not on emotional sobriety. I'm just a member. I'm going to share a little bit of my experience, strength, and hope. One of the things I love about Alcoholics Anonymous, there are many, but one of the things I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is that I might share with you tonight some opinions that I have or some ideas that I have, and next week I might not even agree with my own opinions. So I love that we're able to make some changes, that we're able to have, you know, that kind of humility to say, you know what, that's just not working for me anymore. And uh, what are you doing? And let's see if that's working better for me. Um, and that has happened many, many times in the years that I have been sober. But again, going back to someone who might be new, I just want you to know that when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I never planned on staying sober for 48 years. That when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, if they could have promised me, if those old timers would have promised me that if I went back out there and drank some more, I was going to die, I would have run out that door because I wanted to die. I had wanted to die for a long time. I didn't want to be here anymore because life just always hurt way too much for me, you know, and um, I needed alcohol just to survive. Um, just to not be locked up in some kind of a mental institution because it all hurt way too much and I couldn't face what was going on in the world ever. And um, what the old timers here convinced me of was that this is a disease that gets worse, never better. And that if we drink again, even after periods of sobriety, uh, that this is a progressive disease. And in the years that I have been sober, 
I have seen that many, many times. You know, I've seen people come into Alcoholics Anonymous and let the life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given them take them away from Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and I cannot tell you, it's almost like a bad you know, movie sometimes how quickly I have seen this disease progress after periods of sobriety. I'm sure it's not that way for everybody, you know, but, uh, but I've seen it happen so many times and it's been so painful uh, to watch. So I do believe this is a progressive disease. And I personally believe and have believed since I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that I was one of the people that if I ever went back out there, that I wouldn't be lucky enough to die, that I'd continue to live the way that I was living that I've continued to hate myself more and more every single day and hate everything about me and my life. And uh, alcohol wasn't working to shut off the pain anymore. That's how I ended up coming here to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I just was at the jumping off place when I got here, you know, because alcohol, I couldn't drink anymore and I couldn't believe that I was going to have to stay sober. And I wasn't happy about having uh to be in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, not that many people are, but I was not. I felt really sorry for myself for a very long time in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, chronologically, if you'd looked at my birth certificate, I was 13 years old. But I felt about 2000. And people who didn't know how old I was, they were guessing my age at 37. And, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I was really broken. I had just been beaten up by the last friends that I had. I didn't have any place to live. I didn't have anybody in my family that would have even accepted or collect phone call. Um, none of the uh, alcohol recovery homes that were in LA, <clears throat> Los Angeles at the time would take me. There were only a couple back then, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I had uh, dropped out in seventh grade and uh, I'd just been beaten up by my gang, my own gang. And so I really had no place to go but Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am so grateful for the kindness and the tolerance that was shown to me here in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was way more than I deserved by the type of behavior that I came here with. But despite the way that I came here with a rotten attitude, hating everybody, hating myself most of all, and I think, I suspect if you hate yourself, it is rather hard to like others. I didn't like any women. I didn't want to sit next to women. I didn't want to talk next to women. I didn't want to hug women. I certainly didn't like listening to women speakers. And as far as the men that I met here, the only men I'd known in my life, when alcohol got involved, they got violent and the women always lost. So I didn't want anything to do with the men either here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was kind of a problem because when I got sober in 1972, they just had men and women and I didn't like any of them. But I went to lots of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to 21 meetings a, a week for the first two and a half years, not to get a gold star in AA, but because I had absolutely no place else to go that was indoors. Um, you know, it wasn't like I'd, you know, just stay home and watch TV. I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have a TV. <laughs> um, you know, there were no other options but meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm extremely grateful that they had that many. And I kind of love this whole Zoom thing um, you know, because I know that anybody new can go to meetings pretty much uh, almost 24 hours a day. And, uh, and I'm going to a lot. I mean, my sponsor has actually talked to me about, you know, having to cut back on my meetings because I've gotten just so caught up in traveling around to different countries and I've had so much fun. Um, but I've gotten a little bit exhausted, you know, as well. So I think this format is fantastic and I, I know it's going to continue. Um, so, you know, I'm going to jump around, which I do anyway, um, not just because I'm doing this talk, but, you know, in the forward to the 12 and 12, it says that these steps and these principles are designed to allow the sufferer to be relieved of the compulsion to drink and to live happily and to be happily and usefully whole. And I love that happily is in there, you know. Um, I wasn't happy for a long time after I got, you know, sober. Uh, I just, I don't think I was capable, you know, of being happy. I was racked with self-pity. And it took years in Alcoholics Anonymous for me to even begin to give up some of that self-pity. You know, there used to be a song back in the uh, 70s when I got sober. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure if this was the title, but I think it was. And, you know, um, it was, you know, I haven't got time for the pain. 
and that was the song. But I always had time for the pain. Like I would make extra time for the pain. You know, I mean, I knew how to have more pain and I arranged it because that's kind of what I just thought life was all about was suffering and pain. And I thought I deserved a lot of pain. So it really took a long time for this healing um, and for this psychic change that I believe has happened for me and that I've seen happen. I've definitely had the educational variety um, of some kind of a spiritual experience. And one of the things, you know, um, just in case, because as I said, I'm going to be jumping around. But one of the things I've thought about a lot, you know, just in the past year, really, is that line in the book where it says great events will come to pass for you and countless others. And in the years that I have been sober, that has been absolutely true. So if I say nothing else, you know, let me tell you, go to some meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous so that you can hear different people share in different ways. Because another one of the things that I think is one of the greatest strengths we have here in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we are people who normally would not mix. And so because of that, we look at things differently, we respond differently in different ways. And the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works in all those different ways for all those different kinds of people. Um, so, you know, in the early years that I was sober, I remember hearing an old timer say that the measure of our spiritual well being, shall we say, or our spiritual temperature has to do with our ability, how we do while we live with unresolved, prob unresolved problems, with life's unresolved problems. Now, actually, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm a person who drank to not feel. I know there's a lot of party animals in Alcoholics Anonymous who went out and they wanted to have a good time and feel beautiful and have fun. And that wasn't my story. I drank to not feel anything at all because everything I felt always hurt. Um, and I didn't mind missing some good. I just wanted to miss it all, you know? So I think that when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was sort of hoping if I really worked this program that it would kind of be like an emotional bulletproof vest so that nothing would ever hurt me again, which of course is not what happened at all and not really what happens to any human being. And it's not a very mature way of thinking. Um, but it was kind of what I was hoping was that Alcoholics Anonymous would protect me from any type of pain or any type of bad experience. Well, over the years, I've come to find that that is absolutely not true. And I don't believe that that's the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, Bill talks about in his story that this is a design for living that will help us through the certain rough spots ahead, which seems to infer that there will be some rough spots ahead. And in the years that I've been sober with the people that I have known, I've seen a lot of people walk through a lot of rough spots. I have the most amazing online home group right now. Um, I've been involved with this group for about a year and uh, we have newcomers and we have uh, four people, they call them dinosaurs because the meeting came out of uh, Florida and that's anybody with over 50 years. So we have four or five dinosaurs that are there every day I've ever been there. I don't go every day, but they seem to, those dinosaurs. And, um, and so we have that whole range, you know, from people who are, you know, in their first few days uh, all the way up. And I'll tell you, if you came to my group and you looked at that group, and I'm going to say we average maybe 50 people. I don't know exactly, but let's just say that. If you came and you looked at that group, I was thinking about this today, you won't be able to tell which one there has a brain tumor and is going through treatment for that. And then we have another person who's going through intensive chemotherapy. And you won't be able to tell which one that is either. We have another person who's waiting for a lung transplant. And you won't be able to tell who that is either. We have six regular members of that group who've lost a child in sobriety and have stayed sober. And a whole host of other things that have gone on. And I want you to know, by the way, I don't want you to think that this is all people who are you know, in their 80s and 90s. These are all people who are younger than I am that are going through these things. We have a woman on that group who's got three children and has not been able to find a job for a year. And she's, um, she's sober just about a year and a half. And she goes over to the church to pick up food um, that they donate to her and her family while she's really trying, you know, and she shows up. And I'm telling you, if you came to this meeting, you won't immediately be able to tell who of these people are walking through these experiences. And what I mean by that is that 
as we learn to practice these principles in Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't have to walk around miserable, even while we're walking through incredibly difficult times. Um, and there's so many people in Alcoholics Anonymous that I have seen walk through so much more than I've ever been handed in the years that I've been sober. And I've seen them do it with dignity and a sense of humor. And I think that that's a measure of our emotional sobriety as we are able to show up. And that's one of the things that I, I think is so important. You know, um, one of the people, you know, um, yesterday that showed up, I went to a meeting and this woman showed up. And the day before, she found out that her husband of, you know, 40 years, they had found a massive tumor um, and, uh, and it's malignant, you know, and she had a commitment at a meeting. And she didn't not show up and stay home and, and cry. She's crying, you know, sometimes, and she cried at the meeting, but she showed up, you know, and, um, and these are the kinds of, you know, of things that I have watched people walk through. Now, I want to mention when I go back to that great events that I've seen a lot of joy and incredible, wonderful experiences that happen here in Alcoholics Anonymous, but there is a mix of both for most human beings in life. And, you know, I have certainly been one to feel sorry for myself sometimes when something is happening to me. Um, and I don't mean to say that I only did, did that in my first 90 days and now I never feel sorry for myself because that's not true. I do sometimes feel sorry for myself. And yet most of the time I can stop and I can look after I have that pang of feeling sorry for myself, like why is this happening to me? Or why is my daughter having to struggle with that? Or why is my mom having all of these challenges or whatever it might be? When I look back, I can step back and I can see, you know, it's like a, a friend of mine, you know, uh, used to say, you know, any problem I'm having today is in an area that I didn't even have an area when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I didn't have these areas um, and I know how to show up, you know, and I know how to act better than I feel. Um, and I know how to think about someone else besides me, but that took a long, long time. You know, years ago, I was at a meeting and I, you know, came to Alcoholics Anonymous hating everything about myself. And it stayed that way for quite a while. You know, there's another line in our book, avoid the deliberate manufacture of misery. I did not avoid the deliberate manufacture of misery. I was a famous manufacturer of misery, you know, um, in those early years of sobriety. And one time I was at a meeting and this guy shared and he said, you know, an egomaniac is not necessarily who some is not necessarily someone who thinks well of themselves. And I stopped for a minute because I thought, well, that that doesn't make sense because that's exactly what an egomaniac is. You know, it's someone who thinks, oh, I'm the best looking and I'm the smartest and I'm the most wonderful. And so this speaker said, so an egomaniac is not necessarily someone who thinks well of themselves. And I thought, huh. He said, it's not even necessarily someone who thinks often of themselves. He said, it's simply someone who thinks only of themselves. And I thought, oh, I'm a terrible egomaniac. I never thought of it that way because I was always thinking, I'm so ugly. I'm so stupid. I'm the worst one here. I'm so damaged. I'm so broken. I've had the worst life. I'm never going to figure out how to work this program the right way. I'm never going to get that relationship with a higher power that they talk about. I'm never going to be capable of having a relationship with a human being. I'm never going to be able to keep a job. You know, and these were the kind of things that I constantly told myself. And yet, as I showed up in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I got hope because I saw these incredible things happening. I saw these great events happening. And of course, you know, being self-centered and selfish and thinking only myself, I thought, well, they wouldn't happen for me. They'll only happen for them. And one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous is that you don't have to believe that these steps and practicing the principles and the traditions in your life, you don't have to believe that they'll work for you from the work. They can still work even if you don't believe in them, because I've often not believed that this program could work for someone like me. And yet I've gotten the amazing results, sort of like what Dr. Bob talks about in his final talk, you know, that these results are available. We know the answer. We know the solution. And they're available to anyone who practices them with the same zeal, you know, of someone who wants to have a different result in their life. Um, you know, it talks about in our book on page 20 um, that we must get rid of this selfishness. We must or it will kill us. Our constant thoughts have to be of others. And, um, you know, I, 
I, I didn't think of anybody else for a long, long time, except as I began to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and as I have continued to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous through these years, I did show up for my commitments. And when I did that, eventually, when I was 11 months sober around, I can't remember exactly, but something like that, I remember having this thought, and it was the first thought I'd ever had about myself in, in any kind of a good way. And that thought was, I'm a good member of this home group. And I was, I showed up and I put out that literature and I did what I was asked to help that group. And I did it for fun and for free, just like Chuck Chamberlain used to talk to us about. You do it for fun and for free. And you know, to me, it was huge that Alcoholics Anonymous was free. It's still huge to me that Alcoholics Anonymous is free. If Alcoholics Anonymous had cost $5, I wouldn't have been able to stay in AA. I didn't have $5. I didn't have a dollar to put in the basket till I was well over 10 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, so I love that this thing is free. And I looked around when I got here because I knew about scams and I'd seen people that were working and conning and all of those kind of things. And I could not figure out how all these people were doing these things for others, these acts of kindness and these showing up and they weren't getting any money for it. This isn't about money. And I think that's just an amazing thing that we, you know, fell into really in a lot of different ways as we look at the history. And so I was thinking about, you know, different things, you know, um, I love little stories and that's sort of something that helps me a lot. I don't always remember who they came from, but they, you know, they helped me. Uh, this one time I have this, uh, this friend and he was the sponsor and he was sponsoring a guy uh, named Michael and Michael is a doctor and Michael was a doctor at a hospital and he was a big deal at the hospital. I mean, a big deal, you know, and, um, and he wasn't sober all that long. And he called, Michael called his sponsor and he was ranting and raving about, you know, this hospital and they're not doing things right. And that surgical nurse, she didn't have my tools the way I told her to. And I just, you know, I don't think I should have to put up with this. And, you know, this is outrageous, you know, for a doctor in my position. And, you know, he was just going on and on. And his sponsor said, Michael, he said, what do you think a, an adult would do in this situation? And Michael just like stopped and got off the phone quickly and, you know, had to think about that, you know, for a while. And so, you know, these little tantrums that we sometimes are having um, and our immaturity, which Dr. Harry Tebow talked about as one of the chronic symptoms that alcoholics seem to have and not noticing them, you know, having to find out um, that we have these things and having our sponsors or someone that we can trust as a guide kind of pointed out to us where we're being selfish and self-centered. Um, you know, I think another thing is, is that, you know, what I found is that back in the day, I used to get sent to Chuck C a lot. That was where people in California, they sent the problem cases. And I was a problem case in so many different ways. And I had real problems, by the way, they were not imaginary problems. You know, not that most of us don't come here with real problems, but you know, I mean, I had a host of them, you know, I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have any education. I couldn't keep a job. I didn't have any money. I had court cases that I was facing and I was illegally in the country facing deportation. So these are real problems. They're not just imaginary things that I was feeling sorry for about myself. They were really big. And, you know, and I just wanted to kill myself. I really did. Even in sobriety, I just thought, I don't think this AA thing can work for me and I'd be better off killing myself. But obviously, I wasn't very good at killing myself because I had come to AA, I was still alive, you know? So I would get sent to Chuck and, you know, many other people, I mean, he had just an open door policy. He was really phenomenal. And so people would get sent to Chuck and I would get sent there and I didn't have a car. So someone would drive me and he was about an hour away um, and we would get there. And then Chuck would talk literally for three or four hours, hardly without, with a, without taking a breath. And, you know, it was kind of like, you know, Clancy used to joke about with his sponsor, but it was kind of like I was barely able to blot out most of it before I went insane. You know, this man would just talk on and on and on about spiritual principles. And I just wanted to know how to not get deported or pay my rent. You know, I didn't want to know about spiritual principles, really. And I remember him saying at one point, you know, to me, he actually said it many times because he said everything he said many times. But the funny thing is, I just want to mention that many of those things that he said many, many times that meant nothing and did not help me in any way in the early years have come to help me tremendously 
you know, many years later. Uh, so I'm glad I heard him and listened, uh, even though I didn't seem to apply at the time. But I remember him saying at one point, when I told him all these problems, he said, you already have everything you're ever going to need. And you already are everything you're ever going to be. I thought, well, this was not good news to me because I didn't feel like I had everything I needed and I didn't like who I was or where I was, you know. Um, but in, in a, as we study, you know, if we look into spiritual wisdom teachers, it turns out that most of the time what they're trying to pass on to us is that we already have everything that we're ever going to need for our spiritual experience. It's mainly a lot of times what Chuck used to talk about is uncovering, discovering, discarding, getting rid of whatever's in the way. Um, that's keeping us, you know, from being who we're meant to be, because we're each a unique, you know, creature that has something to offer. And um, it's been, you know, just a long, long journey for me. You know, I have, I have a couple of cats, I have a couple of cats and a dog. And I have these two cats and a dog, and I have this little box of treats. And I will, the minute they hear the refrigerator open, they know that I've got the box of treats. So the three of them come running. And I have this one cat, and this cat, he is so interested in what the other two are getting that he doesn't eat his own treat. So I give him each a treat. And the little boy cat is so interested in trying to get the girl cat's treat that the dog just eats the boy's treat all the time. And he's not able to like enjoy his own treats. And I was watching this. This was, you know, during Zoom. Obviously, I have a lot of time to think, you know, during the pandemic. But I mean, as I was watching this, I thought that is what I have done a good part of my life is instead of enjoying all the wonderful treats and all the benefits and lovely things that are happening in my life. I've been very focused on, well, what are they getting? How come I didn't get that? What are, you know, why are they happy? You know, how come that didn't happen for me? And it's that you know, that feeling of not, you know, of not being able to be satisfied. And again, going back to Chuck C, you know, he used to talk about, you know, if the ocean was filled with alcohol, it's not enough once we have an obsession. And if we need alcohol, we cannot be satisfied from the outside like that. And so this is one of my many lessons that throughout the years that I've had to get in touch with and to sort of notice. Um, that I have to, you know, to try to appreciate what I am having and to try to enjoy it because I have been overpaid beyond anything I could possibly tell you. But it's taken me a very, very long time to appreciate all the many wonderful things that have happened, you know, in my life. Um, and, you know, part of that's because I was so wrapped up in feeling sorry for myself and being a victim. And, you know, one of the things that I've come to see, I, I heard someone just recently on a, a Zoom call um, say this, and I, I wrote it down on my little uh, daily calendar. And they said that it's almost impossible for recovery to begin until the blaming stops. And I just thought that was just a really interesting, you know, way to look at it. Because um, I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, it was everybody else's fault especially my mother's. And it took a long, long time, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous for me to start taking some responsibility, you know, for some of the problems that I had, for some of the manufactured misery that I was creating um, and some of the situations that I was putting myself into. And of course, some of that has to do with our old ideas. And that's part of why, as we go through the process of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we look at our inventories, both in step four and in step 10. And then hopefully we check in with our sponsor or a guide and they can kind of help us look at, you know, where we can, we've gone awry in our thinking um, or in our planning. You know, I heard another guy uh, at a meeting at my home group and he, my old home group um, my, in, in real time. And, uh, and he was saying, you know, it's like when we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, it's as if we have a giant mountain of sand in front of the door, wherever we're living. I mean, we can't even see over it. It's way taller than we are. And it's way wider than we are. It's just huge. And you come to Alcoholics Anonymous and your sponsor says, I'm gonna give you this teaspoon. And every morning, I want you to take a teaspoon and put it in the backyard. And you're like, a teaspoon? I mean, did you see this thing? It's a mountain. I can't see over it. I can't see around it. I, I said, I need a crane. And they go, yeah, just take this teaspoon. And, you know, when we come over and visit and when you work with a newcomer, they're going to bring their teaspoon and, and we'll take a little teaspoon of that sand. And, you know, that's kind of how slow the process of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life 
um, and emotional sobriety has been a lot of the time. It feels like I can't be getting anywhere with just this. And then I get to a point where I'm able to, to be in the sunlight, you know, like he talked about, to find a quiet place in bright sunshine. But I don't stay there all the time. You know, um, I wish I did. I think it would make a much better AA talk if I told you that, you know, I just did that and now we're all done and now I'm in the bright sunshine all the time. But I have to watch out for my thinking and I have to watch out for selfishness and being self-centered because I'm still a human being and I'm still wired that way, apparently. Um, but things are way better. You know, I, I have been relieved of the bondage of self a lot of the time. And it's a huge uh, gift. Um you know, one of my favorite stories in the book, um, it's in, I want to look at my time here and see what happened here. Make sure my timer is working. Okay, great. It says I've got a few more minutes here. So, you know, one of my favorite stories in the book, it's in the family afterward, um, which is when I first, well, so let me tell you about reading the book the first time. So when I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, I went to these 21 meetings a week, somewhere in my first year, I'm going to say you know, six or nine months, somewhere in there, I was at a meeting and this woman spoke, don't remember who she was, but when she started talking, she said, could I see the hands in this meeting of all the people? I'm not asking this. She did that, but this is what she said. She said, can I see the hands of all the people in this meeting who have read the entire big book of Alcoholics Anonymous cover to cover? Now, I was in that meeting. I'm going to say there were a hundred people in the meeting. I don't know. I'm just guessing. And I would say I had not read the whole book, so I didn't raise my hand. But half of the people I'd say raised their hand in the meeting. But I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm sure some of them were lying. OK, but anyway, so half of them said that they had you know, read the book and I didn't raise my hand because I had. Now, I didn't know how often this woman talked. But I wanted to be sure the next time she talked, I was going to be able to raise my hand that I had read the entire big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I went and I read the entire big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to let you know, almost 49 years later, no one has ever asked that question again, but I am ready. You know, I have read the whole book. And so again, it's like, it doesn't even matter what my motivations might be. They might not be the best and they often have not been. But if I take the actions, sometimes I get some good results. And of course, originally when I first started to look at the big book, there were all kinds of chapters that really did not apply. Two wives, no, didn't have one. Family afterward, didn't have any relationship with my family, didn't need that. Two employers, I didn't have a job and wasn't really capable. So there were all these chapters that I just didn't think applied and I would skip. But anyway, now as I read through that whole book, I found there's some amazing stuff in that chapter, the family afterwards, in the other ones as well. But anyway, one of the things that it talks about is it talks about father, you know, in the uh, archaic language that we have there. It says, you know, father is gets so excited as he finds this spiritual answer. And he kind of gets a little bit arrogant because he thinks he's got the answer and anybody else that's not in AA doesn't really have the answer, you know, which I've been like that at times. So, you know, in my earlier years, thankfully, I'm a little bit better now, a little bit less arrogant, I hope. But anyway, so he gets excited and he cannot believe, he just can't wait to pass on, you know, this. But he actually, at first, he wants to cling it, cling to it because he doesn't know, you know how much there is and he, he doesn't wanna lose it. He's gonna to cling to everything that he's got. But the thing is, as it says in here, it says he doesn't realize that he has struck a limitless load that will continue to pay dividends for the rest of his life, which is very exciting, provided that he gives away the entire product now, I'm telling you, all these many years later, even still, when I read that, I go, the entire product? I mean, shouldn't he give away like half? I mean, the entire product? But that's what it says. You know, we have to give it away in order to keep it. And as we continue to keep giving it away for fun and for free, we continue to get overpaid over and over and over. You know, another line in the big book that was that really became very helpful to me when I went through a really hard time. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that because, you know, sometimes when we think about in Alcoholics Anonymous, helping the alcoholic who still suffers, we often, of course, think about the new person and they are one of the most obvious people there to be suffering because, you know, most of us don't come here on a winning streak, but 
sometimes the people who are suffering in Alcoholics Anonymous as we stay sober, we find are the ones who've been sober for quite a while. And especially during this whole, you know, past year, I mean, I've really seen, you know, just so many ways that uh, the people have had a hard time. And many of them have been long-term sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we've had a few long-term sober members that have lost their spouse. And instead of us being able to sit with them or visit with them or bring them food, you know, because of the, you know, pandemic, we've been, we haven't been able to do that, you know, and uh, we haven't been able to do the traditional things that we've been able to do. And then of course we can't give hugs and, you know, there's just been a lot of these kinds of things. And I've known people who've had people in their family be very, very sick and in the hospital, not with COVID necessarily, maybe, but maybe something else, but nobody can go visit them. And you're sitting there in your car, you know, um, waiting to find out and you can't go. And so all these things that we're traditionally able to do, but anyway, and so, you know, I, I've been very aware over the years, but I had, um, I had gotten married when, um, after I'd been sober, um, for quite a while, I was over 20, I think it was over 20 years sober when I got married or maybe 16, I don't know. Um, but I did, I got married in sobriety and I was in that marriage um, and relationship for 25 years. Um, I have three children and in that marriage, it was a very difficult marriage. Um, we really tried, we both really tried, but it just was not going to work. And after 25 years, um, we separated and ended up moving toward a divorce and got divorced. Now, when that happened, we were not in love. Um, thankfully, there wasn't any big drama where, you know, he left me for my sister or, you know, a younger woman or anything else. It was just, it was time. And it was one of the few times in my entire life that I have ever felt 100% that this was the right thing. You know, very few things in my life have I known so clearly, but I knew it was the right thing. I knew it was the right thing for me. I knew it was the right thing for him. I, I knew it was the right thing mostly for my kids, but I was worried and scared about them, you know, going through a divorce and, you know, and all that that would entail. Anyway, and so at that time, I was about 35 years sober. And um, thankfully, because of this program and my activity in Alcoholics Anonymous and the principles that I had been applying all these years, I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to kill myself. Those things never even remotely crossed my mind. But I was sad. I was very sad. And I wasn't 100% sure why I was sad, but there was a part of me, some kind of an old idea that I had that made me think I was a failure and I was a loser and I wasn't a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous somehow. Um, and I don't know where I get these ideas, you know, because I've never, I've sponsored a lot of people who've walked through a divorce. I've never told them you're a loser or you're a bad AA or thought that about anybody, but somehow I was thinking that about myself and I was, I was really sad. And I was also sad, I realized, because, you know, I had grown up in a lot of foster homes and I'd grown up in a lot of different things. And I thought that if I worked these principles in Alcoholics Anonymous and I tried to live this way of life, I thought that that would guarantee me a long, happy marriage. And that's not necessarily true. What these principles and doing these things guarantee us is a way to live sober through whatever happens to be happening in our lives and it's different for each of us but anyway that's how I was feeling and and so I um I had a sponsor I have a sponsor um my sponsor has 54 years uh sober Bob Regan's my sponsor and uh he actually used to pick me up when I was hitchhiking when I was 13 um because I wouldn't accept rides in AA but somehow if people from NAA picked me up after I'd refused the ride that they offered, I would get in the car. I haven't figured that out yet, but that's just kind of the way I was. And Bob was not my sponsor uh, for the first uh, almost 40 years that I was sober. Um, he just became my sponsor when I was going through this divorce because I knew he had gone through a divorce and I knew that he had two daughters. I had three um, and I knew he had walked through that divorce with dignity and a sense of humor. And I knew that he had a good relationship with his daughters and a decent relationship with his ex-wife. And I wanted to know how he had practiced these spiritual principles in order to do that. And so Bob became my sponsor. Sandy B also uh, became one of my guides. And I talked to these guys uh, all the time, you know, as I walked through this. But one of the times when I was sitting with Bob and we were talking, um, I was really sad. And I really had this sense that my life, that all the best times in my life were behind me. And they'd been amazing. I mean, I felt like I had already been overpaid and I had, um, 
And so I was explaining to Bob that I'd already had all kinds of wonderful, amazing, incredible experiences. And he said, he referred to that line that Chuck C used to talk about and that he referred to in the big book, which is that the most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. And I said, oh, Bob, you know, I know that's true when you're in your first 90 days, you know, like your first year, the most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. You know, I said, but you know, I've been sober 35 years. I've already had the most satisfactory years of my life. I mean, I should probably just get a walker and put some stickers on it. It's all behind me, you know? And, uh, and Bob said, no, I, I don't think that that's true. He said, you continue to do what you have been doing and you will not believe how incredible your life is going to be five years from now. And I said, well, Bob, I don't believe that. And he said, that's okay. You don't have to believe it. He said, I'll believe it for you. And of course, in one of those ways that the sponsors are, he was absolutely right. You know, um, I have had the most incredible years, you know, these last uh, 15 years, you know, since the divorce, um, lots and lots of difficult things that have happened. Um, but lots and lots of great events have come to pass, you know, in my life and in the lives of others, you know, um, and I am just so grateful for this way of life, you know, for these tools, for the old timers and the people that are here. And I'm particularly grateful for a sense of humor. There's a line in our book also that says, we find that cheerfulness and laughter make for usefulness. And I am so grateful to so many of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous who have always been willing to share, you know, their stories and their, um, their humor um, with me. So I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you one other little uh, story that it's just one of those things that, you know, that I remember and uh, that makes me laugh. Don't rush it. Keep it going. Uh, okay. <laughs> I might tell you two then. <laughs> I'll tell you two little stories that they make me laugh and they just, just, just make me feel connected to Alcoholics Anonymous when I make a mistake. So one of them is this woman was sharing at a meeting at my home group again. And, uh, and she said, you know, she'd been sober, I'm going to guess like 30 years, long time, whatever. So she said, all right. She said, I want to tell you about the week that I have, have been having. She said, now last week, she said, I had to go to the doctor for a biopsy. There was a lump that I had and I had to have a biopsy. And, uh, and so she said, um, also last week, I submitted my, a book that I had just written to a publisher. And she said, and also last week, she said, when I was a little kid, I was a movie star. I, I don't know who she was, so don't ask me. I, I wouldn't remember anyway. She said, but when I was a little kid, I was a pretty famous movie star. And she said, last week I auditioned for a part that I really want. So she said, this week, she said, on Monday, the doctor's office called me and they said, we did the biopsy and it's benign. She said, on Tuesday, the publisher called and the publisher said, we love your book and we want to publish it. And she said, on Wednesday, they called about the part that I auditioned for. And they said, sorry, we picked somebody else. And she said, I was out to lunch with a friend of mine. And I said, you see, nothing ever works out for me. And that kind of quick forgetting of all the wonderful things that are happening is why it's important for me to stay close to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, to stay close to sponsors or friends who can kind of help point out to me when I'm way off. So the other story that I, I love has to do with, you know, how, again, our motives are not always the most important thing. Um, this woman was uh, sharing and she said it was her 10 year AA birthday. And for her 10 year AA birthday, she wanted to look fantastic. I mean, she really wanted to be a program of attraction. She wanted everyone to see how wonderful, you know, um, AA had made her life. And so she shopped and shopped and shopped and her birthday was in the summer and she found this beautiful white lacy dress. And she, it was just perfect. It was everything she wanted. And she got this dress and she got very dressed up and she had three kids. And uh, some of them she'd had before she got sober and a couple she'd had in sobriety. I don't know, she had a couple of them. And so she said, you know, she put those kids in the cutest little outfit and a little tie and a little suit for her son. And she practically wanted to staple his hair down so that it would look perfect. And she scrubbed his cheeks. And she said it was the most miserable experience getting these kids ready and looking perfect so that they could come to the AA meeting and give her a 10 year cake. And she said, it was just a terrible experience. I mean, they were all crying. It was just terrible, but she forced them to do it 
only because of her ego, because she wanted to look good and she wanted to, you know, everybody to see that she was, you know, doing this. And she said, and I'll never do it again. I mean, it was just a, the biggest mistake. She said, but I'll tell you about three months later, I was standing in a meeting and a man came up to me and he said, I was at a meeting a couple of months ago. And he said, I saw an angel being given a cake by her three children. And I thought, I wonder if Alcoholics Anonymous could help my family heal in the way that I saw hers healing. And so, you know, I mean, here it is, this woman out of, acting purely out of ego, not thinking in the least about the newcomers and how they might get something from it. Um, and yet she'd been able to help someone else. And I can't tell you, um, you know, how many times the kindness in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the people, you know, that, uh, that have done so much, um, you know, not just for me, but certainly for me. And I didn't even realize it. You know, I've come to find out in these years, I've really come to see how very fortunate I was from where I came from, that I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous at 13, because it was really bad when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was really broken. I really didn't want to go on. And I can't even imagine, I can't imagine actually, how much worse it would have been if I'd stayed out there another 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years living the way that I was living. And I have always believed that that's the kind of life that I would have had. I don't think I would have been lucky enough to just check out and die. I think I would have gone on living with the hell of alcoholism day in and day out for a long, long time. And because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the things that have been passed on to me, and because of Bill and Bob and what they passed on to us, you know, I happen to have gotten sober in a time when Alcoholics Anonymous existed. And I'm very, very grateful for it. So I'll turn it back over to you guys and we'll see what we do next. Thanks. All right. What a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, talk. Thank you so much, Jim. You know, do you ever have that situation uh, or that um, and you have such a dramatic story? And you've got chapters one and two down, like, you know, here comes June G and, you know, she's stabbed in the hospital. And then she's, you know, has super successful career and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, that's like, uh, you've got five more chapters after that. Is it, <laughs> does it ever, is it, was it ever hard not to kind of hide? Was it easy to hide behind that a little bit or? or, or? You know, I, I really, I think because I was, so broken when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, it, it hasn't been that hard for me to remember that everything in my life is a direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't, none of my life could be possible. Um, I really don't believe, you know, I don't believe I have an amazing relationship that I'm, you know, in with a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that Amy's met and probably a couple other people may be on here. And, um, you know, he and I both grew up in a violent alcoholic home and, um, you know, with a lot of broken promises and other things going on. And we, you know, we don't live that way because of the things that have been taught by, to us in Alcoholics Anonymous by our sponsors and others. You know, we have a lot of laughter and we have kindness and we have um, love and it's a safe safe, wonderful place, you know, that we live. And that doesn't mean everything's perfect all the time. We've had health problems, and money problems, and, you know, dog problems and, you know, all of that. But uh, his, his sponsor, Mark's sponsor passed away, a, you know, a few years ago and it was extremely painful. And I've, you know, lost some um, of my closest friends and family members in these years that we've been together. But um, no, I, I've been pretty, uh, pretty able to realize that, uh, any of these things that are happening are not possible for someone like me, but for Alcoholics Anonymous. I sponsor people who've come to come here who had full, wonderful careers and loving marriages and wonderful relationships with their kids until their drinking just took, you know, started to affect that. I'm a person who was incapable of any of that, the way that I drank and lived. Um, I wasn't capable of functioning in any way. It's so cool how, uh, you know, you could even end that story. Like now when I give a talk or something, you know, they, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Does that mm. I continue to have to awaken spiritually in different chapters of my life? And there's so much more that's available in AA than just the first 10 years or the first 20 years. And there's so much more like 
we don't have time to give you, you know, which spiritual awakening, how, you know, what time did I go back to sleep or what new surrender experience have I had to have all those things. But it's, you'd think that the story would be over and the credits would roll, you know, so many years ago. And they're like, no, it just keeps getting more fun. It keeps getting more relevant to my life. Well, I think that, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to tell you that when I'm having a, a challenge that I go, oh, yay, this is great. What a wonderful way to try these principles. And I'll be able to pass this on to somebody else later. But that's usually not my first reaction. Um, but like you're saying, I have been able to, even while I'm in the painful part of the experience, as I was during that divorce, and I've had a, a huge you know, psychic and spiritual shift in the, these last years. But, but even while that was happening, I thought it's really very cool that I could have and learn so much after 35 years sober that I have so much more to learn. It was a little embarrassing or I don't know if embarrassing is the right word. I was a little disappointed. I thought I'd be farther, <laughs> you know, at different times. But then I think, well, how amazing, you know, wouldn't it be sad if I learned everything in the first three years of sobriety? And then I just went thump, 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 trudge, 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 trudge. It's not, it hasn't been like that at all. There's been huge times where I've learned things um, and been like shocked that I didn't know it before, you know? Um, and I, I, I believe that that will continue to happen. And some of these old timers, including my sponsor, who's like in his eighties, and is he sponsors more people than I do. He goes to more meetings than I do. He plays more golf than I do. He still works full time. He has an amazing relationship with his kids, he has a great relationship with his grandkids. He's madly in love with his uh, wife. They just got um, married a year ago on Valentine's Day. He's, you know, I mean, it's just like, oh, fine. I mean, these old timers set the bar so high that I've got years to go you know, and I see a couple members of my home group, you know, on here, my online home group, we've got a guy, Tommy, you know, um, and he got sober at 23. He's got 57 years and he has one of the kindest, you know, manners um, and, and a, the great sense of humor. And again, if you came into my home group and you're watching, you're not going to know which one he is. It's going to take you a while. It's, it's pretty awesome. That's beautiful. So the way we do this is uh, you see the kind of Hollywood squares thing. Can you pick two people to share and then we'll open it up for okay. questions or comments? Sure. Okay. I'm going to pick Bill from my home group, Bill C. My name is Bill Clark. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Back Porch International and uh, the Sober Sunday group in Burlington, Vermont. And uh, what an honor, June, to join you on a, on a meeting like this always, and I've heard you many times, uh, both live and on tape, you always leave me in tears. And uh, I think the, the thump, thump, trudge, trudge really got me because, you know, I uh, and a friend of mine, one of the guys I, I've sponsored is on the call too. And uh, he's seen what I've gone through and I've seen what he's gone through. And we've only gotten closer to the program as a result of that. You know, we didn't uh, dig a hole and bury ourselves. And um, I am so grateful that the program was there when I needed it. I didn't know that I needed it. I thought that maybe I had other kinds of problems, but you know, you talk about the kindness and, and that was the topic uh, at, at the meeting this noontime. And I will never forget the kindness that so many people showed to somebody who was arrogant and angry and just a horrible human being. And they, they shook my hand and they gave me coffee and they gave me jobs and they sponsored me, thank you God. And they allowed me to find my own place in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't ask for that, I didn't expect that. And they just welcomed me in in ways that were comfortable to me and didn't push me away. And so many of them saved my life. You know, I can remember standing on the steps of the East Milton group and uh, outside of Boston and, and talking with Walter. Meeting was at 8.30, finished at 10, we were there at midnight. And he just smoked cigarettes and talked and talked and talked. And I felt calm and I felt connected. And what a gift, 
you know, I've heard so many times in Alcoholics Anonymous that all we have to give each other is time. And I have benefited from that, from so much time, from so many men and women over the years, and, and, and they've saved my life. Uh, June, as always, so great to hear from you. And uh, you're one of those people who I just turn to. And I'm so glad when you're at a meeting and I see your, your, your smiling face and, you know, and, and know that Mark is there too. And what a life we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thanks, Bill. How about Kristen? In Chicago. Thank you, June. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen. And I, I am an alcoholic. Um, that was just absolutely beautiful. I um, got so much out of your lead. I always do. Uh, emotional sobriety is something that I never knew that I wanted. And even though I don't have a ton of time, for me, it's not good enough on it day in and day out just to not be picking up a drink but really working the program and really having um, the spiritual experience to be able to be emotionally sober. And some days are okay. And other days like today it wasn't okay. It was a really, really hard day with my daughter. And, um, you know, she struggles a lot and I don't know what to do. And so, you know, anger comes out and but I'm so grateful because I have this program and I have, you know, people, you know, like, June in my life and she's connected me with some other women that have similar situations. And so I'm absolutely not alone. And um, that makes all the difference in the world. And I, and I say um, often that I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel right now, but I do see the light in front of me because it's the people of AA, like Bill, who just shared, who's my service sponsor and June and so many others in back porch that are just like, lighting the way one step at a time, like Norm Alpe says, um, you know, seconds and seconds and inches. And, um, you know, I know that it's going to be okay. I, I do have that faith. And thank you so much again, June, for your lead. It was just amazing. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, we'll open it up with anybody who'd like to share. Uh, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll call on you. And if you don't have your hand raised, then we'll just start picking on people. Um, what about you, Don? Hi, I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you for sharing, June. Let me get it on gallery. It was on speaker view. Um, I so appreciate the longevity and, um, you know, the history that you gave us and it's um, something that I am, feel blessed with that we have so much of a track record of hope and from just all over the place. And that's what I heard from you. And um, that I am blessed with that track record of hope. And, um, you know, my, my experience with this meeting through this year has been, it's been experiential for me. I've, I've processed through a lot of that um, emotional sobriety reading. And the thing that's most going on for me now is, is a, I'm in a place where uh, I'm starting to be able to understand the level of um, desire that I had for approval from people and how that has gotten in my way for trying to seek or not necessarily gotten in my way. It's carried me far enough for me to be able to understand that the um, next frontier is that uh, approval from a power greater than myself, a source that is within me, not without. And um, I so much appreciate, again, just the longevity of this program that can have me be able to say that. And I am, um, you know, I'm like an alcoholic and, <laughs> and I have certain qualities about my character that preclude me from having that level of maturity and love that the reading talks about. And, um, as I listen to people like yourself and have um, 
the wonderful benefit of being around all that multitude. Someone said in here that all of the, uh, in this emotional sobriety forum, that all of the spiritual literature was ever written is part of my inheritance. And what you just reminded me of is that my inheritance is in AA and it is longstanding and precious. And um, thank you for that. And thank you, Sam. We can't hear you, Sam. What about you, Aaron? Aaron H., what are you doing, man? Hey, what's up, everybody? Aaron, I'll call it. You did say Aaron H., right? I was coughing. I thought I heard. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, boy, I'm so glad I'm here tonight. Uh, you know, June, you know, I, 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 don't, I haven't been able to be here for a month or two because of a schedule conflict. And I called Sam today and I said, you know, I need that uh, log on login info and he just started raving about the speaker and you know and I've known Sam for like 10 years I can know when he a lot of times he'll pick somebody he'll say yeah so and so's doing this he'll be like that would be good won't it don't you think it you know and, but tonight he was at he knew what he was doing so um but I don't know you know there was so many things in there I, I make notes a lot of times when I listen to these are like key points and takeaways and usually I mean I, I get one or two but I mean I have like six here and, and I just kind of quit listing them um that was just really I don't know such a beautiful um story it's hard to comment on all of it you know it'd be like uh if someone was in a coma for the last 14 months and woke up and asked how the how the nation's doing right now, you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't know where to start. Um, but uh, one of the things you said, I I um uh I don't know, kind of tied in. I, I love where you talked about the story about the 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 publishing and in the, the the movie audition and, and um in the in the tumor thing. You know, I, my my life is better today. Uh, than I ever thought it would be. I mean, I mean, only because of this program. I mean, every area is, um, I just never imagined the life I have today. And I've been really blessed. And, and it's something my wife and I joke about. I don't even remember what it was, but, um, but I really don't have much to complain about today. But something small happened. Something didn't go my way. Maybe we, I didn't get a reservation somewhere or something. And I'm standing in my kitchen and, and my mother-in-law was over too. And I looked at my wife and I said, I just have the worst luck, you know, so like I can't and, and they everyone just kind of paused for a minute. We kind of looked around and everyone just started laughing. Nobody had to say anything. It's just um, how something so small and miscellaneous uh, I can lose sight. But um, the thing I, I do want to talk about real fast and I'm going to pass it over to somebody, um, you know, anybody else. But the, the thing you said about the woman with her 10 year chip and dressing her kids up, like, I mean, that that's me a lot. I, you know, I still look for ways to kind of, I don't know, I want people to notice me. I want to be, you know, whatever, validated, you know, whatever the, the thing is. Um, and there was two points in that and you said how miserable uh, she felt. You know, I, I'll, I'll have these ideas in my head, like I'm going to do this on this date or people are going to see this or whatever. And I'm planning for it for like weeks or and I'm driving myself crazy. And I, I don't even enjoy either the event or the journey or whatever. And, and it never feels like um, I think it's going to feel. I always feel horrible after. Um, it's And I joke, it's kind of like ordering off an of infomercial. You know, you see this thing that, um, that looks so great and it's going to make your life so much easier and you get it and it's just this cheap knockoff and you know it's just it's not what I expected at all but um but the bigger point of that was how you said it um that the other the 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 newcomer you know looked at that even though like her motives were bad um how the newcomer saw that and, and how I interpreted that is just how God has a way of just working things out. Like I, I, I almost, I don't, if it was my, you know, responsibility to be perfect or just constantly stay in God's will, don't get me wrong. That's the ideal. Like I do try to do that, but I mean, if, if life working out was contingent on, you know, uh, how well, you know, how shackled Aaron Ham was to perfection, um, the world would be doomed. You know, I, I think that even, I don't know, even when I, I, I hope somebody understands what I'm saying, I, um, that, that God just can kind of use all things that I do as long as I'm trying to kind of do right. But anyway, um, I, I really am. I, I'm just blown away. I've been, I, I, I was out of town for a month and I only went to four or five meetings. So I'm my, my, my AA kind of, um, you know, I haven't done a whole lot of AA in the last month. So this is definitely um, what I needed to hear tonight. So um, thank you so much for coming out. What an amazing story. What an amazing person. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over. Um, Sam, thanks for calling on me, brother. Thanks for doing this meeting. 
Thank you. What about uh, Jerry? Jerry with the blue shirt. I don't know if I've seen you here before, Jerry. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Thank you, Sam. I am what's left of Jerry, and I am an alcoholic. I say that because I drank from 1952 to 2013, and uh, I didn't start drinking hard liquor till I was about six. And uh, yeah, because of this program, I'm living a life today I never knew existed. I, in 1967, I married a church girl and uh, it didn't take too much for a long time with me in terms of rubbing off. But I can tell you this, over the last 53 years with her, I have met, a, and we're still married, which is certainly not my fault. And if I ever talk to you, hear more about it. But I have met a lot of nice people in churches over the last 53 years but I have never met people as honest or as loving and caring or as accepting or as inclusive of the people in these rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't have to be, nobody has to be better than anybody else in these rooms. And there is a maturity among the most immature, the immature of us that just tells me that I'm gonna be okay and if I can just do the next right thing, trust God, clean house and help others, my world is gonna be all right. I, uh, yeah, I was successful. I don't like to brag, but I invented willpower and anything I ever wanted to achieve in life, I was able to achieve. And, uh, but I couldn't stop drinking. And there were several things I really couldn't do at least well, but. Uh, June spoke, and June, thank you so much. Bless your heart. What a story. Uh, you said, gee, almost, almost, I think, thought about killing yourself. In 2013, after 62 years of drinking, I have a granddaughter who, I, I've got five grandkids, four grandsons and one granddaughter. I love the granddaughter more than all of them put together and I love them beyond the telling of it. It's just the way it is. And I would never hurt her. But one night in 2013, I scared that little girl with my drinking actions. And uh, the next morning I surrendered, not to AA or anything. I surrendered to the fact that everybody be way, everyone would be way better off if I wasn't there. So I Googled all morning trying to figure out a way to end it. And I couldn't find anything that wouldn't hurt because deep down I'm a coward. And I wanted to be quick and painless. Anyway, ended up, I hired a guy to shoot me at six o'clock on New Year's Eve in my parking garage downtown. And then there were a couple of days after that, there was a three day spiral that was just insane. But the day that I was supposed to get shot in my parking garage at six o'clock, God and my wife took me to a treatment center and I found out I have a disease. I'm not a broken unit. And all the things that June said are so incredibly true. And so, I, uh, I'm here because somebody believed in me. And I'm here because I found out I've got a disease. I'm not a broken unit. I'm redeemable. I trust God, clean house, help others, be honest. And be, becoming honest and accepting what's going on in my world and where I'd been, what I was, was a game changer. And so today, I just try to be the best me every day that I can possibly be. And Alcoholics Anonymous is the key in these 12 steps. And I'm just amazed how simple this program is and how it works. So June, bless your heart. You made my evening and I sure thank you for that. And I was turned on to this meeting by a couple of young ladies out in Colorado, Keith and Kenda, and I appreciate you guys. This is the best meeting I've run into in a long time. And so anyway, Bless your heart, June. I know I'll, if I end up with 48 years, I'll be 114 or 15. I don't know if that's going to happen. But I do know this. I don't know how much time I got, but whatever time is left is good time, as long as I can stick with this program. Anyway, thanks for letting me share. Thank you. What about my friend Amy K? Hello, Sam. My name is Amy, and I'm an alcoholic. And I got to tell you, I think you undersell this meeting by calling it an emotional sobriety workshop. 
uh, truly to me, this is a spiritual growth workshop. Uh, but I suppose that most of us would, when we lay it out in front of us, really want emotional sobriety. I don't want to lose my mind in the bank anymore. I don't want to be upset. I don't want to be sad. That's what we think of as what will happen if we have emotional sobriety is my feelings won't overwhelm me. I won't feel hurt anymore. But the truth of the matter is that I've come to not as many as many of y'all, but the more I come to this workshop, the more I want to keep coming. And what I hear over and over again is that all of this has to do with getting closer to our higher power, relying on our higher power. Exactly what Bill says in the essay is stop our demands on people and things and situations and rely on our higher power. But what I have come to learn is that the joy in that is not so much the emotional growth I have, but the true feeling of, of amazement of what it's like to be closer to my higher power, to be less reliant on humans and things uh, and to be closer to that. And every one of these meetings I come to, I just hear that it's like whoever said they were writing things down. It's Aaron, you know, stopped at six or eight. And I'm like, these amazing nuggets of, of truth and useful stuff, you know, that we can't really um, have a spiritual awakening while we're still blaming. Well, I hope to goodness that that's not a hard and fast rule because I'm gonna blame, you know, once or twice a day for a second, and then I will remember that's not doing me any good. I gotta quit doing that. And, and the Chuck C thing about, you know, I, uh, I have everything I'm ever going to need and I am everything I, you know, am ever going to be. And that what I need to do is start chipping away at the parts that stand between me and that relationship with higher power. Um, so I, I feel like uh, I've been, whether it's COVID, whether it's these workshops, whether it's the issues that my bless my bless my heart my crazy sponsees are having right now, but all of them add up to exactly this. You know, if you will stop demanding that more people call you every day, or that your husband says yes, I'll be there at five o'clock. Of course, darling, you aren't inconveniencing me. If you will stop being hurt by the fact that those things aren't happening and just let life be the way it is. That, I guess the last piece that I just really loved was the most satisfactory years of our lives lay ahead of us. And I have a friend in the program with 37 years and his health isn't very good. And he says, when he reads that, that he doesn't think that's true anymore. And uh, I really appreciate June, you saying that no matter what our, health issues are or love lives look like or you know how big or small I am or any of that stuff is every day that I get closer to my higher power is a more satisfactory day to me and uh, what a gift that is I hope that I'm still growing on the day that I don't wake up thanks I think the title is really misleading, you know, and sometimes I wish I could scrap it and just put like the next frontier love. The real whole point of it is a spiritual workshop where people can freely speak about stuff they want to. And uh, the first, the beginning reading just kicks that off. I think it's a great reading. So that's what that's about. But so before we lose June, what about 20? What about uh, I used to think when people were 10 years sober, they wore white linen and could like bless people, you know, like and and. And then you get 10 years and you're like, God, man, I'm just, I'm just not like that. I know me. And it's just, it's, I'm not, I'm not like, and then you get 20 years, et cetera, et cetera. But what about guys like Chuck C? You hear tapes of him talking at 16 years, 20 years, 25 years. The guy was like a saint and he, and he, uh, or the perception of that. And he, uh, he would say those things like what you're looking for, you're looking with, and you already are everything you're ever going to be and all that stuff. What was he really like in person? What was that like to hang out with Chuck C? <clears throat> so Chuck was, he was really a very, very special guy. He had a, in my opinion, he had a spiritual understanding that went beyond a lot of what other people had. 
Um, but I think he falls into the class of other spiritual wisdom teachers that I have read about since. Um, you know, I went to a yoga class that I'd, I'd never been to yoga. I went to a yoga class, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. <clears throat> and the teacher had stolen a lot of Chuck's material. I was like, hey, you know, that was Chuck C's stuff. And I started realizing that a lot of these ideas that Chuck talked about are, they've been prevalent for a long, long time in the, the spiritual teaching world. Um, he was uh, a very charming. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, like one of the stories that, you know, he used to tell was uh, this guy uh, called him up one night and he said, uh, Chuck, I want to kill myself. I've been sober about three years. I was, I'm going to kill myself, but my sponsor made me promise I'd come see you first. And, uh, and the guy said, so I need to come see you tomorrow. And Chuck said, I'm busy tomorrow. You know, I'm busy the next day. So you'll have to come, you know, on Wednesday. So, uh, so the guy had to wait. And then the guy showed up, came to Chuck's house. He always was inviting people to his house. So the guy came in and the guy said, listen, I stole a lot of money from the mafia. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's just no way I can, you know, deal with this. And so I'm going to kill myself. And Chuck said, well, you got to go to those guys and you got to say, I'm sober and I'm sorry I stole that money and I'm going to pay you back. It's going to take me a long time, but I'm going to pay you back $5 at a time. And, uh, and he said, the guy said, Chuck, I can't do that. They'll kill me. And Chuck said, well, then you won't have suicide on your mind. So <laughs> 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 so, I go back you know, and he was, to I mean, he always did like I, you know, I got because uh, I had all these criminal, you know, I mean, not criminal, but I had a, a lot of court cases, some criminal ish. Uh, and then I had my uh, immigration issues and, you know, whatever. I was like, I was about two or three years sober and I was ordered to leave the state of California by a judge who wanted sworn testimony that I had actually left. And so, you know, Chuck knew about that. He would see me and he'd introduce me to people and he'd say, this is my friend, June. She's wanted in 48 states and not wanted in the other two, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so he had a great sense of humor. He was just very, very available. You know, um, in the beginning, if anybody ever, you know, reads the foreword to, uh, well, there's a couple parts, actually. There's two forwards in the book, A New Pair of Glasses. Um, and um, that was a transcription of several talks that Chuck gave at a men's retreat. My sponsor was actually at that retreat. Um, he's one of the only people I know that's still alive that was there. But in the transcription of the talks, in the beginning, um, there are two different forewords. One was written by Clancy. And uh, recently, you know, Clancy passed away this past year. And uh, someone asked him, they said, what's the most important thing that you've ever done or what's one of the most special moments in your life and he said it was uh having that opportunity to write that forward um in chuck's book and uh the other forward is a guy who was the one who came up with the idea of putting these talks into a book format and he says that you know he was a person who was in and out of aa he just couldn't get sober just couldn't get sober and yet he called chuck one night and even though he was a loser who couldn't get sober, he thought, you know, he thought, well, he probably won't come. Chuck came over and Chuck talked to him and spent some time with him. And then, you know, Chuck went to leave and the guy followed Chuck and he found Chuck like doubled over in pain because Chuck was actually dying um, at the time. But when um, and I've seen other people like this, you know, despite the fact that Chuck was really sick when someone from AA asked for his help he got like a special type of an energy, you know, that could kind of push him forward. And he was out there interested in giving away what had been freely given to him. So he was really a, a very remarkable guy. He was my sponsor sponsor for 15 years, <coughs> but he spoke like Latin when he told all of these things, you know, um, that you do not help you, you know, like I was interested, like Sandy Beach used to talk about, I'm like, which one's the money step? Which one's the step where you get money? you know, or a boyfriend, you know, and uh, I didn't really want all that spiritual stuff because I, I needed some practical answers, but 
when I was growing up, I listened to the, or growing up, when I was getting sober, I listened to those tapes over and over and over and over again of that ninja tree. You can get them on XA speakers if you haven't heard them. And now when I read the book, I can just take one page or two pages and just get so much wisdom out of one of those lines again. And I can hear him reading it because I heard it in my head, you know, this laugh and I can hear the, I can hear the retreat being played when I do that. But I heard one woman one time and she was giving a history talk on AA and she had been, she had known Bill. I don't remember what the lady's name was, but she had known Bill. And when one of her sponsors uh, was in the hospital dying, she had been really good friends with Chuck. And he walks in, I don't know if this is true or not, but he walks into the, the hospital room. He flies over there to go see her uh, before she passes away. And he said, and, he, and she kind of outside of the room and hears him saying, hey, I'll take, if you'll give me your pain, I'll take it from you. If you'll let it go. And she, and she did. I mean, like it, it, I, oh, that whole story, just the guy was exceptional, man. Sorry I had to pick your brain about that, June, but that was just so cool that you got to hang out with him. It was. Um, I'm very lucky. Do you have anything uh, last minute? Uh, do you have anything that maybe you didn't get to share that you'd like to, that you thought of that we might, uh, you might want to drop on us? Yeah, you know, just, I guess in, in thinking about Chuck, I'll, I'll tell you about, you know, a couple of other, you know, little things. It's all kind of connected. So one of the things Chuck would say often when he would speak, or if you'd go visit him is he would say, if you go to work Monday through Friday, just to get a paycheck, you're cheating yourself and everyone that you come in contact with. And then he'd say it again. If you go to work Monday through Friday, just to get your paycheck, you're cheating yourself and everyone that you come in contact with because you're giving up five days miserable because you're just working until you get a paycheck. And maybe you can enjoy Saturday, but on Sunday, that sausage grinder in your stomach starts going because you got to go back to that job that you don't like so that you can get that paycheck. That's the only reason that you're going. And so what Chuck talked about was doing that shift of your attitude so that you begin to go to work to be of service, to see what you can add at work and what you can add in, you know, in life. And, you know, I mean, again, I didn't have a dollar to put in the basket. I didn't have a place to live, you know, for years. And I, thought that was the most ridiculous thing that meant nothing that someone could say, because it is all about the paycheck. And first and foremost, Chuck had money. So I thought only rich people could say something stupid like that, you know, so I, I really didn't, you know, think about it. But many years later, 10 years later, eight years later, I was working my way through school. I was working as a waitress. And primarily, at least in California, you make most of your money from your tips. And I was, you know, really struggling and it was like, you know, really holding life together, you know, with uh, bubble gum and toothpicks, you know, just trying to make my rent. Um, and I would go in the back, you know, during the, you know, while well, during the evening and I would count my tips and I'd see, oh my gosh, you know, if I don't make more than this, I'm not going to make it, you know, and I just, I need to make more. And I just, you know, got all frantic and, you know, whatever. And being a waitress is actually a very challenging job. I'm sure a number of you've tried it at different times and, um, you know, cause they're always asking for something. They just, they're, they're never satisfied. They just want something else all the time. And all of a sudden, as I stood back there, I just started thinking about Chuck. And I started thinking about looking at my job as a way of being of service. And I started thinking about how I believe, I didn't believe it then, but I, I have come to believe that we are all connected. And so I really started <clears throat> to go to work and to see what I could add when I went to work. And so when that guy said, can I have mustard for my sandwich? I tried to do it with a, a pleasant attitude to give him that mustard because he needed to eat that sandwich because he was going to go over there and he was going to build somebody's house. And then I'd have a woman who was a doctor who was over visiting, you know, from the hospital on her break and she needed more ice for her iced tea. And I was trying to give her some more ice for her iced tea because she needed that because she was going to go over there and she was going to maybe do an operation that was going to help save somebody's life. You know, and I just started seeing how my giving mustard and ice was really contributing and how I was being of service. And I was adding in that little tiny way, you know, no one was, I wasn't going to get a parade for it, which I, I prefer a parade for everything I do, but you know, it was just my way of being of service and trying to add something rather than take something. And I can't always do that, 
but I do, I have found in my life that the more often I'm able to do that, the happier, you know, that I've been able to be. And I was fortunate enough. I've had a career um, that I loved very, very much where I truly believe I was able to be of service. And I showed up, you know, for 37 years, you know, I, I had lots of vacation time because I didn't take the, all those days because I loved my job and I was very lucky to have that. Um, but I do believe that, you know, a lot of that had to do with that shift of going to work to see what I could give and how I could be of service, you know, rather than what I could get in my paycheck. Anyway, that's all for me. Thank you for everything you've done. And um, I love you. I respect you deeply. I really appreciate all the hope you've given people over the years and everything you've done in your life. So thank you for being a part of this meeting and we'll shut it up like this. We usually uh, just meet ourselves and go to our inner and say the Lord's prayer for all who uh, care to, to join us. Thanks so much, Jim. That was a great talk. I really appreciate you and I had a blast tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, June. Thank you, June. Thank you, June. Thank you June. Awesome. Loved it. Thank you so Thank much, you June.